Welcome to this seventh ses session of the Beyond Boundaries Conference entitled Behaviour, the Climate and Sustainability Crises. I'm delighted to welcome um, 560 or up to 560 who registered for this webinar with a wonderful range of countries um, that are reflected here. So I'm very much looking forward to your contributions through Slido, which we will tell you about in a bit. I'm Susan Mickey. I'm Professor of Health Psychology and Director of the Centre for Behaviour Change at University College London. And I will just say a few words to introduce this session. Human behaviour has got us into these crises and changing human behaviour will be necessary for getting us out of them. And changing behaviour depends on understanding it, how it is influenced by the social, political, economic and material world around us, identifying whose behaviours, for example, politicians, industrialists, community activists, a huge range of relevant um, people, and how people's behaviours interact and scale up at community and population levels. In this session, we will have four quick fire talks spanning the disciplines of behavioural science, anthropology, law and geography. These quick talks aim to generate ideas and stimulate discussion that will be captured in a Slido question answer during the session and will be built on in a post-conference workshop, which we'll tell you about shortly. The discussion will be structured around two key questions. The first will be, what are the three priority behaviours amongst whom necessary to slow down climate change? And the second one, will be what are the strategies most likely to be effective in sustaining behaviour change. To tell us about the workshop, I'm now going to hand over to uh, my colleague, Dr. James Paskins from UCL's Grand Challenges. James. Hello, so my name's James Paskins. I'm the Deputy Director for the UCL Grand Challenges Programme. And we've got um, the honour of arranging this conference together with the UCL Global Engagement um, Office. And um, we've been rather bowled over by how incredibly popular this session has become. Uh, and while we had originally planned to have a lot more audience interaction, we've now realised that to do that with, with 560 of you isn't quite going to work. So we are now arranging a follow-up session, a follow-up workshop, which uh, we will uh, communicate the details to everybody who's, who has signed up through Eventbrite. Um, and that will be based on the discussion from today, the original themes and any of the questions that you submit. So even if we don't have a chance to get to your question today, there's a good chance that it will influence what happens at the workshop. So the workshops are run in the new year uh, and it will allow for a lot more audience interaction and discussion. So please keep an eye uh, on our um, on UCL Grand Challenges Twitter feed or, or Eventbrite to find out more. I will hand back over to Susan. Thank you, James. So this discussion today is just laying the groundwork uh, for additional work, uh, which I'm sure will be really productive. So please do sign up in due course. I'm going to give the first talk today and uh, to introduce myself, um, my work focuses on understanding behavior in relation to health and the environment and developing methods to improve the effectiveness of interventions and policies in these areas. Starting point is we need people to behave in line with sustainability development. Who must do what differently? And we need to think about this at global, national, sectoral, organisational, household and individual level. And here are some symbols about the domains in which we need to change behaviour from diet, travel, planting trees, uh, disposing of waste. And key uh, to addressing the SDGs are identifying and understanding why are people not doing it. As I said, we need people to behave in line with sustainable development. Um, and uh, Greta Thunberg, uh, who I'm sure we're all very familiar with, uh, I think said a very uh, profound and important thing. I know we need a system change rather than individual change but you cannot have one without the other. And certainly that's my starting point in my work. Uh, so behavior is part of a system of behaviors 
uh, within people and between people that facilitate and compete with each other within and between individuals, influenced by their social and material world. And understanding the system of behaviours and the influences on them is a starting point for identifying where best to intervene and how. So here is the simplest uh, comprehensive model of behaviour. So for any behaviour to occur, people need to have the capability, the physical and the psychological capability, psychological being knowledge and skills. They also need the motivation. That includes the top-down reflective uh, attitudes and beliefs, but also the more bottom-up automatic motivation of our emotions, our impulses, our habits, our drives. And finally, you can have the capability and opportunity uh, motivation, but behaviours won't happen if you don't also have the physical and the social opportunity for that behaviour to occur. And as you can see, um, these influences on behaviour form a system with behaviour. So where does behavioural science fit in? Here are three uh, UCL based grants um, and programmes of work that I'm involved with. The first is uh, reducing carbon emissions uh, in order to transform cities. The second is um, addressing national policy in Wales of decarbonising their housing stock. And the third is looking at organisational change to reduce plastic waste. So just to say something about uh, the first one, uh, CUSH, it's called Complex Urban Systems for Sustainability and Health. This is a very ambitious one to bring about citywide transformation in environmental quality, sustainability, population health and health equity. And we have, in order to achieve this, we need experts from a wide range of disciplines. So we have environmental design, engineering, public health, social epidemiology, system dynamics, and behavioral science. And um, with those thoughts and ideas in your head about the role of behavior within these crises, I'm now delighted to hand over to Professor Nora Gross, who is director of UCL's International Disability Research Center. She's an anthropologist and much of her work has concentrated on vulnerable and marginalized populations, particularly on people with disabilities in low and middle income countries. Nora. Thank you. Um, I'm going to actually uh, take my uh, time today to speak as an anthropologist. I've been talk, told to talk about behavioral change and knowledge systems, but I want to also emphasize uh, the issue and the role of culture in these discussions. Um, Culture is a, an overarching conceptual framework that provides communities and people with a sense of their past, their present, and their future. We often talk about development in terms of uh, values, morals, choices. It's often a discussion that's both acultural and ahistorical. Uh, we also talk about pillars of um, the three pillars in the post-2015 uh, 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 firmament about being economic, social, and environmental. For the SDGs specifically, and for development more generally, we speak in terms of social interactions, society, economic decisions, but all individuals are also part of culture. Culture influences how a person or a group behaves towards others in society. It helps frame social, political, and economic decisions, both at local and, gov and uh, larger governmental levels. Um, people's sense of their place and cultural heritage can be very powerful tools in addressing climate change, reframing issues such as consumption, relationships with the environment, and our obligations to each other. Uh, there have been some attempts, limited attempts, to include uh, culture in the sustainable development goals. Um, UNESCO has the Hangzhou Declaration in 2013. There were the Florence Declaration on Culture and Creativity, uh, Creativity and Sustainable Development in 2014. But overall, culture is largely missing from our discussions. It's not part of the SDGs. It's not a target with SDG-related activities. There are a few uh, bleak mentions, um, safeguarding cultural heritage, for example, and sustainable tourism. But this is different than the broader issue of what culture can contribute to the SDGs and behavior change. 
Um, uh, so a uh, culture allows us to speak uh, about values, norms, and social practices in development on a broad, uh, broader level than the personal or the individual. Um, culture can provide a framework within, within which individuals and communities can discuss things like cultural diversity and biodiversity, consumption patterns, and sustainable environmental management practices. Uh, we can talk about local and traditional knowledge, values, beliefs, worldviews, on ways of living. Um, and we can talk about local and traditional knowledges that can also be uh, shared globally as a model for addressing uh, uh, climate change issues on a much broader scale. Um, uh, on the opposite part of the slide, for example, I uh, have a, a, a picture of the um, uh, runner up for the 2020 Rethinking Future Architecture Awards that just came out. And it's a, a modern building that's using the ancient Indian concept of step wells to uh, control temperature, both heating and cooling within the building, saving on uh, biocarbon emissions. Um, Currently, culture in international development is linked mostly to issues of sustainability, if it's brought up at all. But I would argue um, that we can expand and offer, and the concept of culture offers important avenues for new and creative discussions. Um, there are, of course, limitations to this as well. We um, don't get understand how culturally sustainable development agendas can sometimes be brought uh, to and worked um, uh, to a larger scale. There is a range of definitions of culture, although we do need to ask whether we need a consensus on all these definitions in order to begin to get work done or discussions begun. And the concept of culture is different, uh, difficult to operation operationalize. But again, that I still would argue um, uh, should enable us to have further and meaningful discussions. So in conclusion, a culture as a sustainable system of knowledge, it's not the entire solution, but right now we're not bringing it in at all. And I think it should be part of all our discussions and all our frameworks, both for the SDGs in general and more broadly for issues of climate change. Um, there are a number of different examples. I put a few on the slide that it took me five minutes to find online, but you know, most of you know about many more things like this slow food movement out of Italy, the indigenous food movement out of uh, Canada and the United States and Australia, the uh, Green Belt movement uh, from Kenya on, um, on uh, sustainable forestry. Uh, uh, all of these things can be valuable tools. And I think it's missing in much of our discussions, uh, including many of the discussions that we're having right now. So I throw it into the mix and I thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Nora. Now I'd like to pass over to uh, Maria Lee who's Professor of Law and Co-Director of the Center for Law and Environment at UCL. Maria teaches and researches environmental law, in particular the ways in which law shapes decision-making on environmental matters, including the ways in which it creates space for publics and civil society. Maria, over to you. Thank you, Susan. Um, now, the primary ambition of law very frequently is to change behaviour and efforts to change behaviour very frequently are underpinned by law. So law is obviously crucial to this decision, but law is not a simple plug in when we're looking for behaviour change. Law both structures and is structured by our ways of life. Law both reflects and shapes social norms. The definition of behaviour change that we're using today takes us beyond individual behaviour change, and I think that's appropriate. We do need to think about communities and institutions and culture, Nora, and equally importantly, this approach takes us beyond the idea that technological fixes, or indeed technical legal fixes, to, for example, climate change, can be imposed from above without having to worry about people. In my four minutes, I'm gonna raise three connected issues quite quickly. First, I'll start with COVID. There are lots of lessons here, none of them are new. The key thing is that formal state enforcement cannot bear the full load of legal implementation. 
But equally, the shadow of enforcement is important, not least because otherwise the rest of us just feel like fools. Um, two very simple things. The rules need to be legitimate. That means they have to be good, including effective rules made by a good process. So law requires democratic and expert input. And the law must be and must be seen to be applied even handedly. No rapid reinterpretations of the law in the interests of the powerful. And this leads to my second related issue. Once we know what we want, is law effective? Simple legal changes don't transform society. Legally binding climate change targets, successful litigation against governments or carbon majors are a crucial part of driving change, but they don't in themselves do anything. These laws are part of a complicated story of constructing new ways of thinking and of living. Law matters, and so does law's silence. Law can have very powerful impacts. It can be directly coercive, or its unique authority might send signals about what's considered important indications of social consensus. When law does work, very often our expectations, values and behaviours eventually align with law. Law becomes embedded in normal life. We forget the struggles that got us here. And everything I've said so far raises my third point, which is rule of law. There's a rich scholarship. Rule of law um, has oppressive as well as emancipatory potential. But keeping it simple, I mean essentially that law must be justly arrived at, it must be complied with, and it applies equally to everybody. When those conventions are not taken for granted, things are not going to go well for climate or indeed any of the other SDGs. Rule of law is though more than the making and the implementation of rules. Climate law doesn't necessarily come labelled climate law. In the background are laws that, for example, seek to ensure that the powerful are open to other voices. Does the law require corporations to, close their, to disclose their carbon emissions in a meaningful way? Does it provide meaningful rights of participation in decision making? Can we challenge those with power in either political or legal spaces? To conclude, um, law plays a big role in shaping conventions of behaviour, economically, socially, politically. It is strangely taken for granted in some of these debates and its complexities are often underexplored in activism, scholarship and policy. So I'll leave you there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maria. And for our fourth quickfire talk, I'm delighted to welcome Mark Maslin, who is Professor of Earth System Science at UCL. Mark's the leading scientist with particular interest in understanding climate change in the past, the present and the future. His books include the highly successful Climate Change, A Very Short Introduction, and The Human Planet, How We Created the Anthropocene. Mark. Thank you very much, Susan. It may seem strange, but I'm going to focus on just one SDG, which is climate change. And the reason for that is it's a threat multiplier. It actually makes all the other SDGs so much harder to do. Think about actually looking after the health of your people when you're getting more extreme weather events. Think about trying to protect your water resources when suddenly your rainfall has become much more unpredictable. But this is a huge challenge. If we look at the historic emissions, we've now peaked in 2020, and to actually get to a pathway to allow a one and a half degrees rise, we need to have hit zero emissions globally by 2050. And then after that, we need to then have negative emissions. That is a huge order. So to do that, we need 
win-win solutions, or as I say, win-win-win solutions, because there has been a problem because quite a few of the ideas to actually deal with climate change actually can conflict with the SDGs. So we need to build solutions that firstly reduce greenhouse gases, improve people's health, and actually perhaps improve or reverse the environmental damage we're already doing. So we need a whole plethora of ideas. And these come from the collective. So we need governments, corporations, and individuals all to be part of this net zero carbon emissions target. And this is really important because this builds on Nora's work, which suggests that, of course, we need cultures and we need cultural change to actually understand how and why we need these changes. We need the rule of law to actually enable this. But what we really need is to start off with is leadership at government level. That then will cascade through policies, such as the ones that Susan's been talking about, into corporations. Many corporations are actually already leading the way and actually making huge pledges about cutting their carbon emissions. And let us not forget about the individuals because it's the voices of the individuals which actually make government and corporations understand that this is an incredibly important policy change that has to happen. And the really interesting thing is, if we do the calculations, if we all do this and we go to net zero, actually it could save the world about $46 trillion. To put that in context, the world generates about $88 trillion per year. So it's a huge amount of money. Now, we've heard about lots of different policies, which, for example, planting trees, recycling, things like that. But I'm going to leave with one last big idea, because I think we need to actually have a paradigm shift in the scale of our ideas. So this is a, a, a a project for the USA. How do we actually deal with all the internal flights? Now, we could get rid of 80% of all the internal flights in the USA by having high speed trains, both on the east and the western coastlines. Now, this is brilliant because one, it actually means that people will get to the, where they want to go quicker, faster, and safer. You also then have a building program that will have a huge increase in employment in the US, particularly with blue collar workers. Of course, you demand it have to be, of course, US uh, technology, and therefore it would be a massive vote winner. So again, this is a classic win, win, win. And those are the sort of ideas that we need to have to solve climate change, to reduce the pressure on the other SDGs. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Mark. Well, I hope uh, with these four quick fire talks, we've covered a range of areas that have got you thinking about the two uh, big questions that I posed at the beginning of this session. I'm now going to hand over to my colleague, Dr. Joe Hale, who will be moderating the next bit of this session, including your input to it and our reflections on your input. Joe. Thanks very much, Susan. I'm really delighted to be chairing um, panel discussions for this event. I think we're going to have some um, really interesting conversations. Please do um, start adding your comments and questions to the speakers in the Slido Q&A. Um, and I will be selecting questions, um, taking those to our speakers. Um, so keep adding those throughout. Um, as James mentioned at the start, even if we don't manage to um, get to your question in this session, it will be captured uh, for the future workshops. So um, please get going. Uh, in adding things to the Slido. I should just introduce myself um, before uh, we get to the panel discussion. Um, I'm Dr. Jo Hale from the UCL Centre for Behaviour Change, uh, where I'm a senior researcher in environmental sustainability, and I also convene um, the CBC's Environment and Behaviour Hub, which anyone who's interested in behaviour interactions can join. Um, so thanks once again to the speakers. Um, I can see that we've already got some great comments um, coming in for you. The first 15 minutes of this panel discussion, we'd like to focus on um, a sort of focus question around what are the priority behaviours by whom uh, for slowing down climate change. So we're going to um, take 
questions, particularly around those for the panel for around 15 minutes. Um, and then we will clear the Q&A so that you can have a bit of an audience vote on what you think uh, are the priority behaviours. But to start off uh, with some questions that came into the panel, which are related to this question. Um, the top one that we have is uh, an anonymous question. Um, what are the panel's thoughts on when cultural norms or practices might sometimes be at odds uh, with some climate change mitigation actions. We'll perhaps go to uh, Nora first to answer that and um, then take comments from the others. Thank you. Well, like, um, thank you. Um, like anything else, uh, uh, you pick and choose. So if there are uh, things that are at variance, with, uh, with climate change, then we don't have to accept, it's not all or nothing. Um, uh, two things about culture that's very important to know. One is that there are a number of different ways cultures frame things. So we can have culture work with governments, with scientists, with advocacy groups to define what works and what doesn't. And also very importantly, the same culture doesn't mean that cultures don't change. And I think it's really important to note that cultures change all the time. So just because something's been practiced in the past doesn't mean invariably we're, we're uh, locked into having it go forward in the future. I'm just saying that if we don't acknowledge it and work with it, then, then, um, then you're going to get pushback um, or things are not going to work. But it, 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 uh, just because it, 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 the, um, the idea of culture Culture is an important framing tool, but that doesn't mean that we have to stick to it blindly. Thanks very much, Nora. Um, Susan or perhaps Mira, would you like to add any comments to that? Um, I mean, I, I was just thinking about this idea of cultures changing, and sometimes culture changes very quickly, but sometimes, uh, well, generally it changes much more slowly. But if you think about quick cultural change, You'd think about mask wearing in London, in the UK, over the last few months. It's been around for a long time, but not here. So we do respond, and it's important to think about all of the other bits of the picture. So institutions really, really matter, and institutions and culture interact with each other. So I don't think we ever just sort of throw our hands up and say, well, we'll abandon that important part of our life, be it democracy, culture, whatever, in order to deal with climate change. We think harder than that about how to engage. And if, if I could add to that, um, thinking about what does culture add to behaviour in terms of understanding behaviour, I think the mask wearing is a very interesting behaviour because it can signal um, we, ca we care about you, we're trying to protect you, whether it's uh, key workers working on buses or in shops, um, but it also um, the opposite, uh, certainly in the States of not wearing masks is a uh, libertarian standpoint. So this rather simple behavior as to whether you uh, put a piece of cloth over the lower part of your face, um, can be communicating on the one hand in one set of cultural values, caring and compassion and um, good citizenship. And in another uh, totally different context, um, not wearing it is not seen as a sign of the person's lost it or the person's um, for health reason not able to wear it. It's standing up for a particular ideological standpoint. Could, could I add, these are all important um, uh, points. Um, a culture is not, we treat it as a megalith, but in fact, within any uh, society, different people are going to interpret, there'll be a continuum of uh, how people, how seriously people take culture when they follow it, when they don't. Um, my point more is that we can't ignore it. It is an organizing principle that's, that really profoundly shapes individual lives and uh, decisions on a social and government level. But it's, it's rarely uniform. Thanks very much, everyone. I think that brings us quite neatly to um, the question of how can we apply the lessons learned during COVID-19 in terms of behavior or change in reference to policy and legislation to environmental behaviours. Um, perhaps, Susan, you could kick us off on that and then I'll bring in the others. Yes, um, we'll actually sit on uh, the government's scientific advisory group in emergencies, uh, specifically in their behavioural science grouping, and I also sit on Independent Sage. So I have been thinking about some of these things. And I think one of the most obvious um, things to come out of it in relation to sustainability 
is the changed uh, transport um, and traveling with um, many more people working from home and therefore not doing long commutes every day and not traveling around the world, often for uh, one short talk or a meeting. And this is obviously saving huge amounts of carbon emissions, but it does raise the issue about um, what does build back better mean and how in this question here, do we use policy and legislation to underpin it? Now, I think most people um, who've joined this session would agree that we do not want to go back to what we were doing before, which was you know, flying over the, over the world, especially if you're an academic, um, when it's not necessary, um, and also traveling in and out of work into city centers uh, when it's not necessary. And I think, first of all, one needs to have a vision of what the alternative looks like, and then that can be backed up with many types of uh, policy um, and uh, well, legislation being one kind, but there's many other kinds of policy levers that we can use. And in relation to uh, work, just to take that one, I think the vision of um, people no longer commuting um, from areas well outside of cities, which often are abandoned in terms of uh, the cohesiveness and the economy to travel into cities, that one can envisage um, more local working hubs where big employers would rent a uh, desk space uh, for people to use as they, as they want, because people are very social animals. We don't always want to be isolated in our houses, but this way people wouldn't be traveling so much. They could walk or they could cycle to where they were working. And they could also work alongside people in their own communities, their own neighborhoods. Um, and this I think could constitute one of Mark's win-win-win, whereby um, you, know, you save on the cost of travel, you save on the mental, mental and physical health costs of travel, and you get to know people in your community. And then that will get more engagement and more uh, local economic and social and cultural regeneration in many neighborhoods and areas that have become just sort of residential, almost ribbons. So that's kind of one vision and there are many more, but I would say that we do need the vision alongside the levers. Susan, I, I also think that um, COVID has actually thrown up two other major issues. The first is a lot of people around the world have realized that when the chips are down and things are really serious, the only group that actually has their best interests at heart is government. It's not the companies, it's not the corporations, it's actually government that tries to actually implement policies to try and protect them in most countries. The other thing with climate change, however, is it's brilliant that we stop flying and that we stop commuting, but that only dropped carbon emissions by between four or between four and 7%. Because what we suddenly realized is, most of the emissions come from around the world from generating energy, from making sure that we have electricity and heating for all our requirements. And so what it says is, yes, we can change all our in, uh, individual behaviors and we can make a small change. But if we were going to get to net zero, we really have to tackle the major elephant in the room, which is how do we generate energy? Um, I, I, I think the jury may still be out on whether everyone decides the government really is being responsible. <laughs> <laughs> um, we shall see. But hopefully, one hopes that our experience will um, reinforce our desire for competence, which includes a certain amount of specialist expertise, and also that it will reinforce our idea, our ideals of democracy and participation. I mean, both of those things are plausible outcomes. And um, one other thing I say about COVID is it's shown us how not to do it. Um, we do not want to have to respond to climate change overnight. We've seen the really deep hardship and sadness mm -hmm. um, created by responding to a, an emergency overnight, and, and that's, that's not the way we want to do it. Thanks very much, everyone. Um, let's get to the next question on, is it a chicken and egg problem? 
um, around consumer behavior or profit seeking corporations that cause unsustainable living. So can we reduce consumption permanently? And I think this is quite related to some other questions coming into the chat about um, kind of whose responsibility do we, do we see it as um, to change behavior for climate change? Um, and can we use the same kinds of behavior change mechanisms um, for climate and, and for other issues? So who would like to kick us off on the chicken and egg problem? Well, I'm happy to, given that there's a, there's a silence. I mean, I think one of the things we did with this session, um, for which I take no credit, whoever set the session up, which was really positive, was not to make this just about individuals, because it's never just about individuals. They sit in societies and cultures and institutions and all the rest of it. So it would be, I think, completely unrealistic to expect individuals through their behavioural choices to fix the problem of climate change. We have to um, have an interaction between all of the different levels. Could I add to that? I think that part of the problem is we often put these issues in terms of either or. It's government or it's industry or it's individuals. And I think that although there are um, both through the SDGs and other and um, a lot of the work on climate change, there's a discussion of integrating uh, all these different levels. I don't think that, that that's been worked out to the extent where it's where the average person could look at it and make sense of, of, of you know, where they're supposed to come in. So I think we need more work on how to integrate these levels so that everybody, it's everybody's responsibility. Because if it's no one's specific responsibility, or if it's not, you know, if it's not your specific responsibility, if someone else is supposed to do it, then I think it's very easy to pass the, the buck. I also think we have to be very careful on the whole focusing on the individual because this has been a new way that climate change skeptics have approached the issue because what they've said is, well, it's your fault. It's you choosing to have a car. It's you choosing to have, it's not the oil companies. They're just providing a supply and a demand which you are creating. So I think we must step back and say, well, actually what we need is government to take uh, ownership, make sure that we have Pop, uh, proper rules and regulations, rule of law, as Maria says. But then we actually then invest in having companies that actually are then fulfilling the need of both the country and the individuals. And I think you're absolutely right, Noel. We just need it to be much more cohesive and actually interactive. But don't blame the individual. Yeah. And um, in, in my presentation, I mentioned the word systems. Mm -hmm. And the fact that individuals are very important parts of the, of the system. And I think where the individual becomes problematic is when, um, the, as, as has been said, uh, the fingers point at the individual saying, you know, it's your responsibility to do something about this. Um, but we know that our behaviours are incredibly constrained by governments and by industry. Mm -hmm. Um, and by advertising, um, by basically the profit motive from the moment we wake up in the morning till we go to bed at night. But on the other hand, um, people's behavior, when it uh, becomes collective and organized, can be a huge influence on both industry and government. And I liked Mark's uh, intersecting three circles representing industry, government and individuals. Um, so at the moment, for example, we are seeing it played out in terms of um, paying for um, lunches for school, vulnerable uh, school children uh, during the holidays. Um, you know, this is very likely, it started with one individual uh, and it's now huge networks of individuals coming together in different ways, organizing, protesting in various ways. Um, so I think that um, the individual is not just the individual as consumer, the individual can be the individual as lobbyist, uh, as spokesperson, as um, protester. Uh, so I think we need to think about individual and individual behaviors in the many different identities uh, that we have. So we may be speaking out with an academic hat on and uh, making a difference. We may be in our own personal lives, um, vegetarians and buying all our clothes second hand, but we may also be talking to the media. We may be involved in community or political campaigning. 
Uh, so I think there's a real richness of the ways in which individual behavior can affect these bigger systems. Could, could I add something as well, just to take up, uh, follow on the points that are being made? Um, I really like Mark's uh, last slide on the uh, proposed high speed train in the United States. Um, as an American, I can say that uh, it, it's, uh, this is one of these win-win-win situations. It's not only much needed, but if you go back 100 years, many of the towns in the American West and Midwest, they were centers for what was an established identity, identity, uh, in the first place, the industries that came up were based on the train. The train is taken apart after all in large part with a lot of from the oil and uh, car manufacturing country companies in the states and people in these small towns. Now uh, there's no public transportation. They must use cars. But if you go back to trains and you use trains as part of the cultural heritage of these communities, I think Nora, your uh, sound quality is going, so uh, we've, we've put you off video. So hopefully, sorry about that, Nora. Um, I wonder if we could, uh, sort of while we're on the theme of um, how can individuals uh, uh, sort of spark some of the top down action needed um, and, and interact sort of from the bottom up, um, I wonder if we could take this question is action by groups like Extinction Rebellion um, effective? And I know they've, they've been in the news um, this morning and recently. Uh, so, uh, Susan, you've been involved with Extinction Rebellion a little bit. Do you want to say anything about this? And then perhaps um, we can hear from Maria and Mark as well. Uh, well, my uh, main involvement with Extinction Rebellion was taking part in a panel discussion called Ask the Scientist that was organised by the scientific part or one of the scientific parts of Extinction Rebellion. And we had an audience that was even larger than the audience uh, that we've got participating today, which is 35,000 people from all over the world. And I thought that was uh, very impressive. Um, it, it's an interesting, uh, I don't know if we call it organization, organization and a network, um, because it's very much um, a uh, informal coming together, uh, sort of bottom up, based in um, not only geographical communities, but kind of domains of interest. And responding uh, to, to a crisis. Now, um, the extent to which they will be effective, I would suggest um, will be rather like if people remember the Occupy movement, which was pr protesting against mm -hmm. the huge inequalities in society. I think it will very much depend on whether they manage to link up in any meaningful way with other civil organizations in society, um, whether they be some of the political parties, uh, trade unions, etc. Because I think that the history shows us that the more organizations link up with others, the more longevity they have. And I, I do hope they do have the longevity and um, build on what they've started, because I think it's really drawing attention to the problem. It's getting people engaged and active. The issue is, can they link up with sufficient other organizations and strategies to uh, make a coherent and effective strategy? So jury's out as far as I'm concerned. I don't know what other people think. Well, I, I have to say that it's like Extinction Rebellion and others. So one of the interesting things, if we think of Fridays for Future, the idea that students in school would take off a Friday once a month and go on strike up to 4 million young people went on strike on the last strike before COVID. This sent a huge shockwave through the political classes because having a bunch of people sort of sticking themselves to train, et cetera, you can dismiss that. But having normal school children saying, I'm sorry, you adults are mucking up my world. Please fix it. And what's really interesting is we shouldn't get pessimistic. In the era of COVID, Climate change has maintained incredibly high level of media attention. And we have a major, major announcements. Firstly, UK is going to go carbon, uh, net carbon zero by 2050. So is the EU. The EU have just uh, revised their figure. And so therefore, by 2030, they want to drop their emissions by 55% compared with 1990 levels. And the big one in September, 
was that the president of China on a video link to the UN said, China will have a long-term net zero target by 2060. So we have a huge seismic shift in the geopolitics of climate change. Now, whether we can link that back to this groundswell of popular opinion and all the extra science is another matter, but it must have made a uh, big effect. And um, just to add to that, I mean, I, I think they were effective. I agree with both Mark and Susan, they were effective. Query, query how effective they can be going forward. Um, but the one thing I want to add is the rule of law point. Um, laws protect or inhibit rights to dissent and rights to protest. And those, uh, those laws need to be noticed and they need to be supported. Absolutely. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, I think we'll wrap up this first part of the panel discussion there so that we've got some time next um, for the audience to kind of put in your views about what are the key behaviours needed to slow down climate change. So um, just in a moment, uh, I think the organisers will clear the Q&A for us. Looks like that happened. Um, so if you could um, add to the Q&A your suggestions in just a few words. So hold any questions or comments that you, that you had for the panel. And in just a few words, um, put as one idea at a time uh, what you think is a key behaviour by whom um, for slowing down climate change. So we are looking for uh, behaviour by and then the group or person or um, type of people um, that action applies to. And then please start kind of upvoting um, the ones that you see coming in, which you think are the most important. We'll have a couple of minutes um, for everyone to keep adding ideas and upvoting them um, before we look at which ones have come out on top. <laughs> Excellent. So I can start to see um, some suggestions coming in already. Please do keep adding those and um, upvoting them as you see them and make sure that you're adding in uh, not just the behaviour, but who it applies to as well, whether that's everybody or a particular group of people. Um, and then we'll take these responses as well um, and use these as uh, materials for the follow on workshop. So uh, just while those are coming in, perhaps the panellists might also want to have a think about um, which behaviours and uh, groups of people you think are most important to. Um, and when we get to uh, reading out some of the responses, um, we can see if some of those line up uh, and if you have any comments and questions about them. Thanks very much for all these suggestions. These are in a really great format, which is extremely helpful. Fantastic. Well, we've got... Um, suggestions flooding in from all sorts of different perspectives, uh, which is fantastic and will be really great for the follow on workshop. I'd like to sort of close um, the activity there. So if you're just um, finishing typing in, make sure you hit send um, and we'll stop uh, taking suggestions now. But um, just to take some of those uh, which seem to have been kind of upvoted the most, um, hopefully uh, you can all see them at the top of your screens and the panelists can too. Um, upvoted the most, perhaps because it was one of the first suggestions and, and maybe that reflects um, how important it seems to be is changing diets. And we actually had the comment about the chicken and egg question from earlier in um, our private chat that really we should be uh, on plant-based diets with no chicken and eggs um, if we're going to be uh, tackling climate change. So around changing diets, uh, then we've got the next um, highest voted uh, behaviour is behaviour by local governments to transform cities to be more sustainable and resilient. Um, that's quite a big package of behaviours, I think, there. Um, certainly one we'd all agree is important. Um, and then next we have whole system carbon tax covering agriculture as well as energy and transport. Um, a lot of others that I've seen are around transportation shifts, food choices again, um, energy use, education, uh, reconnecting with nature, uh, legislating for circular economy, um, degrowth, uh, closing the value action gap, a lot of different suggestions in there, but perhaps to take the top few around changing diets, uh, transforming cities and carbon tax. Um, would anyone on the panel like to uh, comment on the, uh, any of those particular behaviours? Um, well, actually, I was going to uh, say that I thought Mark should come in first because I've heard sure. Mark speak before about the relative importance of these kind of behaviours because um, I'm not an in environmental scientist and certainly you know, I read and get very convinced that actually the, the really where the biggest buck for your money is in terms of changing behaviour would be, for example, around agriculture and diet. And then I read something else 
and it's around housing. Uh, so, Mark, you're the expert in this area. Um, so I have to say the problem with climate change is we have to do everything. So ranking them is great, but actually my, my view is we have to do all of them because we have such a large challenge. The changing diet one is really interesting because it goes into that win-win-win because if we reduce the amount of meat in our diet, that firstly reduces the carbon emissions into the atmosphere hugely. Um, secondly, it also improves people's health. The amount of diseases and uh, health problems related to red meat is large. And so therefore you can win-win by that. Um, also, if we incentivize our agriculture, we can change our agricultural product, uh, productivity, A, to increase it, but we can also make sure that it stores more carbon in the soils. Soils are the forgotten uh, friend of climate change because it's the soils which we need to look after because they do store lots of carbon. So agriculture and diet are really key globally to trying to deal with it. And the other problem is that, of course, um, our desire to have beef particularly is driving deforestation around the world. So actually, the third win is that we reduce the amount of environmental destruction that we're doing. And actually, perhaps we can start to uh, reforest and our forest uh, major areas. So that's the diet one. For the whole system carbon tax, actually, I'd step one back, which is says, why don't we remove carbon fossil fuel subsidies? And this is one of the huge issues around the world, which is governments are literally paying companies to actually produce fossil fuels. And this is compounded because if we look at the largest 25 oil companies or fossil fuel companies in the world, 19 of them are state owned. So when we blame the private sector, go all oh, these evil oil companies, et cetera, well, actually, no, because the majority of them are actually owned by countries who are quite happy to give them subsidies, tax breaks, and things like that to produce a lot of the petrochemical dollar. So the interesting thing is we need to start there, remove those subsidies. That frees up a huge amount of money for governments to use on perhaps healthcare, perhaps on subsidizing renewable energy, subsidizing uh, food uh, for um, young people that are in poverty. So I think that's where we need to start. The cities one, I'm definitely going to leave to Susan. <laughs> could, I, could I come in on uh, the two things that actually Mark has been um, commenting on? And actually, Joe, you might like to say something about cities, given that you are working in this area too. Um, you mentioned the win-win-win of um, reducing meat consumption. And I think there's a fourth win that follows on from the environmental destruction, uh, which is reducing the likelihood of future pandemics which often obviously is very dear to our yeah. hearts currently. And when you see, uh, and we haven't seen the end of it, but the economic and you know, well-being devastation that's happening globally as a result of the pandemic, I hope this can be fed back all the way, fed back, so to speak, into actually, well, let's look at how we get the food that we're eating and what is causing this kind of uh, pandemic. I'm, I'm halfway through an excellent book called Spillover, which is about how pandemics uh, start. It was written before COVID-19. Um, and it's uh, in incredibly interesting about um, the disruption of ecosystems um, really leading to um, reservoirs of viruses in, in new types of animals and then onto human beings. Um, on the issue about uh, reducing subsidies, um, and, and the oil industry, I completely agree. But when one gets to thinking about how to change this, uh, one can't avoid um, issues of vested interests and power. And, and that actually means uh, politics. So I think there's a whole other agenda there. And unless one actually grapples with that agenda, uh, things aren't going to uh, shift. So it's a, a big issue. Joe, did you want to say something about the cities? 
Um, well, actually, I'd like to go next to you, to Nora and Maria, if that's OK, to just um, tackle the, the question about diet and any of these others um, before moving on. But then after um, taking these few points, we'll um, move on to our kind of next main discussion question around uh, strategies that are likely, most likely to be effective in sustaining behaviour change. Um, and I could talk about cities then. But first, um, Nora, did you want to come in next? The sound quality is not great, I'm afraid. Sorry, Nora. It's very challenging to hear you. Um, Mira, did you want to make a comment? Um, I just want to say something on diet and meat. We're talking a lot about diet and meat, and I think it's because it sounds easy. So it sounds like it really is something that's in our hands. And for very privileged people like us, it probably is in our hands. We can just choose not to eat red meat. Um, but actually, it is as embedded in our institutions, infrastructure and politics as all of the other things. Um, you know, a cheap burger isn't just cheap protein and cheap fat. It's also cheap tastiness. And, you know, replacing that isn't necessarily going to be that straightforward. So all I wanted to say was that all of these things are, um, are harder than they sound. All of these things require institutional and infrastructural change. Great, thank you so much. Um, I was sorry to sort of cut off discussions, but it would be great if we shifted slightly to thinking about um, our next main focus question. What are the strategies most likely to be effective in sustaining the kinds of behaviour changes um, that we've all been talking about to, talking about and upvoting? Um, so if I could ask the organisers to clear the Q&A, which I think they've already done brilliantly, um, then please do start adding your comments and questions to the panel around this question of sustaining behavior, behavioural changes. And perhaps if we could sort of start with a question uh, that came up before, which I think was, um, do we need to achieve net zero by 2050 or should it be zero carbon emissions? So I don't know if Mark, you want to um, address that uh, before we start talking about some strategies for how to do that. Okay, so the reason why people talk about net zero is because we do have facilities to actually remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And the problem is because we've actually put in so much CO2 now, think about it, since 1990, we have doubled the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. That means anthropogenic CO2. If we'd listened to Margaret Thatcher in 1989, when she gave that talk at the UN, we would be in a lot less problems than we are now. But the interesting thing is because we've got there, we need to actually get down to zero as quick as possible. And as I said, it's such a huge challenge. We have to actually do everything. So just by changing our energy, agriculture, all of which that Maria absolutely is correct saying, they're individually, they're tough, they're really, really tough. Even if we do all of those, that still won't get us to zero. We need actually a little bit of help, i.e. sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere carbon capture and storage. We need to plant lots and lots of forests. We need another trillion trees. And even that's not going to be enough because when we get to 2050, if we want to stick to one and a half degrees, after that, the sting in the tail, if we then actually have to continue sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere. So we have to get to net zero and then have to do even more. So it's like, well done guys, you've made to 2050. Now you've got to go and do it even more. So that's why people talk about net zero, which is the balance between what we emit and what we can suck out, instead of just blanket zero, because some areas are near impossible to get to zero at the moment. Thanks very much, Mark. Um, I think that was a really clear answer. And we're getting a lot of um, suggestions coming in through the Q&A about strategies that might be effective in uh, sustaining kind of behavioral changes we need, um, which is really great. So I'm saying things like um, any strategy needs to be inclusive, uh, that we need to um, embed in uh, early in the curriculum and start with parents, um, others suggesting we need to target values and attitude change, um, and we need more at the social and community level, uh, using education and cultural shifts, habit formation. So I'm seeing a lot of different strategies here, which I think um, tap in really nicely to uh, the framework, um, the COMB model of behaviour, which Susan 
uh, presented earlier on. Um, and if I could kind of come in at this point to talk about sustainable cities and what we're doing on the Kush project that Susan introduced. Um, we're working together in a really interdisciplinary way with um, all sorts of researchers from different backgrounds, but particularly working locally in cities in partnership um, to use frameworks like Combi, um, along with other frameworks that we know are effective in um, changing behaviours, but to do that in a local participatory way, um, because the uh, logic being that um, cities are really uh, poised as kind of local hubs uh, where people can come together uh, in the different types of groups that we need, uh, to ensure that the types of actions we're doing are, are um, tailored to particular local contexts, are inclusive of different groups. And so it's kind of looking at uh, tailored solutions for these major challenges and ones that can be um, not just uh, one size fits all, but actually sustainable within the local area that we're working in as well. Um, so I don't know if uh, Susan wants to say any more about sustainable cities or um, if any of the other panelists want to comment on strategies a bit. Um, well, I'll come in on this uh, top um, question or comment here about educating people uh, for sustainability rather than just about sustainability. Um, I mean, education is all about giving people knowledge. And what we know in every area of, of, of one's life, um, if one only sticks at knowledge, uh, one's not going to change behavior. So going back to combi, knowledge is a small part of uh, capability, but there's also, um, you know, you can have all the knowledge. If you don't also have the motivation and the opportunity, uh, then you're not going to uh, change behavior. And uh, several years ago, I we, we've been talking about various frameworks, um, whether it's legal frameworks um, or um cultural frameworks as ways of, uh, sort of tools for thought and for action. And I looked uh, to see what frameworks there were for behavior change across many different disciplines, anthropology, sociology, economics, psychology, and I identified 19. And there was quite a lot of overlap between them. And actually they came down to nine intervention strategies supported by seven policy options. And out of those nine intervention strategies, education was there, but it was only one, and there were eight others. And I think what so often happens with um, intervening, one jumps in with one thing rather than considers all the alternatives. So I won't mention policy at the moment, I might come back to them, but just in terms of direct intervention strategies, in addition to um, education, we have persuasion, we have incentivization, we have the opposite, uh, coercion, we have training, we have enablement, we have role modeling, we have environmental restructuring, and we also have restrictions. So depending on one's analysis of the behavior in its context and whether one's wanting to shift uh, capability and or opportunity and or motivation, one would choose one or more of those types of intervention to make an overall intervention strategy. So education, yes, uh, but it has to be education plus. Yes, yeah, so I think we've seen that with um, uh, the news recently that climate scientists are more uh, fly more often than any other kind of researcher, uh, which just meant to show that um, knowledge alone isn't enough. Uh, I think we have some comments um, from Nora and from Mark. Mark, would you like to go? Um, so thank you, Joe. Um, actually, these are all Nora's point because unfortunately she's dialing in from the wasteland of North London that clearly doesn't have any internet access. Um, so one thing she wanted to mention was that um, often groups of people, older adults and children, seem to be pitted against each other in the climate change and the sustainability uh, debate. But actually, we've missed a lot of uh, opportunities to build alliances. The idea of future generations and actually adults and children working together for future generations. And she also, one other thing she wanted to mention, which picks up on what Susan was saying about pandemics, is we really do have to think about the genetic diversity of our crops to avoid this monoculture and also to build resilience of our crops because we are going to have a changing climate. And so we need to actually make sure that our food security is actually preserved through the genetic diversity and basically not losing our wilds. 
Great, thanks very much. On that point about generations, um, Maria, how does that fit in with the legal perspective? About generations being pitted against each other or not? Uh, yeah, or perhaps it, it just put it in a more positive way. Um, how could we include uh, the, the needs and um, uh, focus of different generations? Um, so, in the so I think the key thing, if you're, from my perspective, from my legal perspective, which isn't the only legal perspective, is to think about the way law empowers people who are otherwise less empowered. So... Um, the, the, the things that in law we call the Aarhus principles, so access to information, public participation, access to justice, which sound quite banal and can be banal in the way they're implemented, do not need to be banal. They can be thoroughly emancipatory um, approaches to law. So rather than looking at climate law, you look at your access laws and you look and see whether information is being presented in a way that is open to all generations. You think about whether participatory mechanisms actually prioritise the retired, which can be quite quite common, or whether participatory mechanisms are open to all. But I think the um, key thing about um, Nora's um, point there is about inclusivity, and that means everybody, it's not just about generations, and also about thinking about who is not included when we think we're being inclusive. Thanks, I think those are really excellent points. Um, and I wonder if perhaps we've got a couple more minutes um, on this part of the panel discussion um, before uh, moving to kind of final remarks. So perhaps I could suggest if the um, audience uh, continue to upvote some of these great suggestions that we have coming in um, about the key strategies likely to be most effective in sustaining behaviour change. And then we'll do a, another rundown um, before we close the panel discussion. But on, on inclusivity, I wonder if um, perhaps Susan or any others would like to comment on uh, how that could intersect with the actual effectiveness of um, the strategies that we're um, well, I, I mean, as as uh, this, I've been listening to this last bit of discussion. I've I've also been thinking about resilience, um, and resilience of not just individuals but um, communities and uh, populations, and thinking about everybody within those um, communities and populations. And I think that when one's thinking about um, changing behaviour, one's got to also think about. This is people doing it for themselves. This is communities doing it for themselves. Um, it's not just about, uh, as, as Maria was talking about, you know, the top down, whether it's um, legislation or other kind of government policies. And I think that one thing that has come out of the current um, COVID crisis, uh, which is really shining a spotlight on things that need to have spotlights sh shone on them uh, from the point of view of the sustainability and climate crises is the lack of resilience of uh, society more broadly. And um, it, it's not only the issues that uh, I was talking about previously about um, use of travel, um, but also it's about how we um, distribute wealth um, across society. And I think this is a really important point in terms of inclusivity. So for example, we know that black and ethnic minority communities um, have suffered much more greatly as a result of uh, COVID than other groups. And part of the reason for that, and a very important part of the reason for that, and actually Baroness Lawrence brought out a, published a report, I think today on this subject, is, is the um, nature of the housing conditions, the nature of the type of uh, work that's um, exposing people um, to more problem and also being in a situation where they're less, uh, they're more vulnerable to that exposure. So I think we need to think about um, behaviour change, not just in terms of um, things being done uh, to and by uh, people and, and communities, but actually building up this sense of uh, resilience. And, you know, an, another issue, and this is actually getting, again, wandering into, into politics, but mm. I think it does show that it's a very big agenda, is um, what we've seen a, a, about our test, trace and isolate system with, without a vaccine, it's our, you know, only hope really of getting out of this pandemic. And because it's been not based in 
uh, the local public health infrastructures within communities, but given uh, to large private companies without the expertise, um, it's been, it's failed, it's been a disaster. Um, so that's another indicator of resilience. And I'm sure there's equivalence of this uh, within, you know, the other sustainability and climate issues. So I think one just has to keep wandering between individual and um, population and be between government and, and between corporation. And also there's uh, issues that we haven't talked about, and uh, I'm sure Nora would have quite a bit to say on this, which is, is that of um, values and where values sits, sits within all of this. Thanks, Susan. And perhaps related to that, we've got a couple of um, uh, comments coming in. Um, so perhaps if I go next to, to Mark and Maria, um, you could sort of incorporate perhaps responses to these. Um, and one is that, um, oh, sorry, it's moved because uh, I think people have been upvoting. So one is that climate change is often seen as a problem for the rich to take care of. The poor don't fly, drive or consume as much as privileged classes do. So there's an issue there around class. Um, and the other was that seeing the lack of diversity in the climate movement, do we think that movements will really be effective if they don't include the voices of the marginalised? So it'd be great if you um, want to touch upon those in the last uh, few comments. So I, I will touch on the one which is about wealth. Oxfam did a really interesting study and they looked at lifestyle emissions. And what they found was that 50% of all lifestyle carbon emissions around the world are actually done by the wealthiest 10%. And the interesting thing is that if you then drop to the bottom poorest 50% in the world, they only emit about 10%. So there is a real mismatch about who is emitting the actual greenhouse gases. And this also then comes back to the really interesting thing uh, to build on what Susan was saying. Lots of climate scientists are accused of being political because one of the really simple things you can do is if you redistribute wealth and people actually have enough money, then they are much more resilient against climate shocks, extreme weather events, pandemics. And, and it's, it's, a, it's almost a scientific law. If people have enough money to be able to be resilient, they are. And so that's not political. It just happens to be sort of like fact. And so I think there is a real issue there. We have to actually consider how we redesign our political systems going forward. I mean, why? Why? in the fifth richest country in the world, are we arguing about whether we feed some of the poorest students and children in our country during half term and Christmas? I mean, we're one of the richest countries in the world. Why is this even an issue? Um, yeah, I couldn't agree more with that. And it's not unrelated, is it, to the things we're talking about. But just going to the other question about um, uh, diversity in the um, climate movement. I mean, it's a really simple answer, and I'm sure there are lots of more complicated answers. But I think the climate movement, as much as everybody else, has to think about how to be anti-racist. And, you know... I don't think they're particularly late to the party. I'm sure they've been thinking about it for a long time, but we've all had a bit of a wake-up call um, over the last year or few months. Um, so them as much as the rest of us. Great. Thank you, everyone. Um, I think we'll uh, just to wrap up this part of the panel discussion there just before we um, move to kind of everyone's final remarks. But um, just before we do that, I wanted to thank you all very much for your um, really interesting and stimulating responses. It's been a great discussion. And I just also wanted to run through um, a few of these suggestions that have sort of um, been upvoted a lot and that we didn't get a chance to cover in the discussion, um, but that we'll, we will be able to capture and feed into um, the follow on workshops after this event. So um, one was around uh, creating a law to oblige food producers to label the quantity of CO2 uh, per gram of food product um, was one suggestion uh, that a lot of people agreed with. Um, another was embedding um, education in the curriculum from early years through to university. Uh, another around habit formation, um, policy designed for long-term change and adaptation. Uh, also decentralization of energy, energy and distributed energy solutions. Um, and we've already addressed uh, tax on carbon emissions. 
um, and more action needed at the social and community level. So I know we touched upon many things um, in those suggestions, but I just wanted to acknowledge some of the ones we didn't get to. Um, so thank you very much for a fantastic panel discussion. Um, I apologise that we haven't been able to get um, Nora back on the line, but I hope she might be able to join us um, for closing remarks and uh, we'll, we'll see um, if we can. So um, Joe's frozen. We have Nora back, um, and and Joe's gone. Um, so ah, uh, Nora, welcome back. I don't know how much of the previous discussion you were able to hear, but before we go on to closing remarks, would you like to make any reflections on the uh, diverse topics that we've wandered over over the last uh, few minutes? Um, well, I think they're all important. Um, I, 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 the issue is that n nobody can address all of these. Well, maybe Mark can, but for, for most of us, um, the issue, if people want to get involved, is to identify things that they're passionate about. So for those who are listening out there, um, uh, it can be overwhelming. And I suggest that people get involved with whatever they feel is, is you know, most speaks to them change is needed in all arenas and everything counts. So um, rather than being overwhelmed, I would say that it's very important for people to identify where they can be, think they can be most effective and to go forward with it. Uh, Nora, thank you very much. That's a very positive message. And um, I, I was, um, I don't know who first said it, but I'm sure many people have said it, but you know, history is made by little people. You know, like like all of us, and sometimes these problems seem so overwhelming uh, that you don't know where to start. Um, or, as uh, one of my children was saying to me the other day, you know, what's the point of changing my behaviour? Because actually, it's the the wicked governments and multinational companies that are to blame. So I think you know, touching back on what was said before, I think this issue about having the broader political analysis, but also having the, um, you know, the confidence and the belief that if people, especially people coming together, do, and as you said uh, eloquently, Nora, you know, do what they feel passionate about, that what motivates them the most, they can make a, a difference. And we've heard uh, examples of that um, earlier on with the, the um, amazing um, school students' strikes. Um, so uh, we've now, you know, had many different uh, questions come to us in terms of the types of um, behavior, the types of strategies to change those behaviors in relation to the sustainability uh, and the climate crisis. And um, we've also heard that uh, all of these um, thoughts and ideas that you've been putting in uh, through Slido are being captured and uh, will be curated in some wonderful way uh, to form the, the, the basis of um, future workshop where we can uh, have more thinking and come out with some kind of uh, deliverable where uh, we can do our bit to translate um, the words we've all exchanged uh, during this last hour and a bit into something tangible that we um, hope can make a difference because the whole point of this conference is for um, uh, people in universities to be using their academic expertise, their networks, um, in order to make a difference in the world out there, and in particular to these big existential uh, threats. So we have time uh, for all of the panellists to give some final comments on um, what they've heard, um, thoughts that they have, and especially um, how we might take these discussions uh, forward in the workshops and how we can translate this sort of thinking into um, practice and policy to make a difference. Um, so um, why don't we, uh, this time Maria, start with, with you and then we'll come to Nora and then Mark and then I'll say a few words at the end. Um, thank you. I mean, it's been fascinating. Thank you, everybody out there that I can't see for all those really um, interesting and sometimes provocative comments that were coming up. Um, we didn't see a lot about law, but we did see a lot of suggestions for using law as a tool. And I think that's 
really important but when we think about using law as a tool let's think about the background law works in a legal system it sounds obvious but we forget that law sits in a legal system and I think it's a bit of a sign of the times that I haven't today just been able to say well this is the sort of law that will best achieve these different objectives instead I've been suggesting that we all need to keep our eye on really fundamental rule of law issues, a culture of respect for the objectives that underpin our law and the procedures that underpin our democratic architecture is at the heart of all of this. And without that culture of respect, I don't think we can expect any sustained or inconvenient behaviour change, especially among powerful incumbents. So I think that we need to keep our eye on the ways in which we govern ourselves generally, and specifically for SDGs or climate. Thank you. Uh, Nora, some final words from you. Um, I, I'll go back, uh, and uh, law is a good example. Law, it sits within a legal system. It also sits within a cultural system. And I would uh, urge us to think broad, very broadly, not just about individual behaviors or uh, current policies and programs of what governments are doing, corporations are doing, but also ask broader questions and include broader cultural uh, concerns when we're talking and um, and issues when we're talking about how do we go out and affect things, you know, and how how do we make change? We need on all levels to uh, to to appeal to people's sense of who they are, what they want, and what they want for for future generations. And I think all of these are powerful tools that, in combination, can start making a difference. Thank you, Mark. So. I start from the point of view that in the current world, there are 825 million people that go to bed feeling hungry every night. That's up by 25 million in the last five years. One billion people still do not have access to clean, fresh drinking water. But we generate $88 trillion every single year. So my take home from this, particularly with the other wonderful panelists, is that we need to change our politics. We need to change our laws. We need to change our cultures and therefore our behaviors so we can have a world that we want to actually live in. So we can perceive our future history that in 2050, we can see that we will have 10 billion people who have the best life that we can provide. We have net carbon zero and we are starting to improve our environment, regrow the wild and actually have a much better environment because ultimately we have to change our belief which is we're not individuals we are a global species in charge of one planet the only place where we know life exists in the universe thank you mark um Gosh, what to add to that? Um, you know, absolutely great uh, final words. But what I will add is that I think what this session has shown is the, the, the breadth of behaviours and behaviour change that need to be um, engaged with in order to make progress in these areas, but also the depth of analysis and thinking um, in order to achieve that kind of change. And I said at the beginning that uh, the four of us represent four um, different disciplines. And I think it's a very good illustration that no one discipline on its own is able to really get to grips with what's needed to, to understand the complexity um, of what is human behavior um, in order to change it, in order to save uh, the planet. And Going forward, I hope in the workshop, we will attract uh, not only many other academic disciplines, but another very important part of the jigsaw, which are all the people out there in whatever communities, whatever organizations, whatever positions um, that can make a difference in terms of implementing the kind of um, thinking and the kind of richness that 
academic um, research and evidence and thought can bring uh, to beginning to do things in a very uh, different way. So I think this is a great um, start of a very, very important conversation. I'm really delighted uh, that it's not the end of this conversation, but the beginning of it, and that our next uh, workshop will be a way of being able to really drill down into some of these key issues uh, in, in more detail. Now, I noticed that James Paskins has come up again on the video. So James, is that because you'd like to come back in at this point uh, to say something more about the follow on workshop? Actually, Susan, every single thing that I was planning to say, sort of the value of bringing together different disciplines, um, the idea that we can keep the conversation going, the idea that we need to broaden out and, and bring in as many people as we can to the conversation. How fantastic all the, um, the speakers have been today and how wonderful um, it's been to see all the contributions from the audience you have covered. So it only really remains for me to say thank you for the grand challenges for, um, for putting to, pulling together such a fantastic group. Um, and I look forward to, um, to, to, to the following workshops. Anybody who has signed up through Eventbrite will get details when we have sorted out what, the, what these workshops are going to look like, but they will run in the new year. Um, and anybody is, is welcome to come along and, uh, and have a more in-depth conversation uh, and, and, and really get to grips with these issues. So, so that's it from me. Thank you. So thank you, James, for um, helping to put all of this wonderful event uh, together, including our session. Uh, thank you to the panellists. I think this has been a, a great discussion and I'm looking forward to having many more with all of you. Uh, to Joe Hale for moderating the discussion so beautifully. And as James said, for all of you who took part and not only fed into the discussion we were able to have on this uh, Zoom, but also into uh, many different um, types of uh, comments that have been captured and uh, will go forward. So many thanks. Um, I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. And I look forward to interacting with you more at the follow on workshop. Bye.